few years ago, um, several of us went on a mission trip to Mexico and built, uh, we actually built a little schoolhouse out of cinder blocks, uh, and we also built a, a little home, what, what most of us would consider a storage shed, but these folks, it was their home and out of cinder blocks. And I remember after we had uh, built this, this house for this family, we all gathered around in that, that little, I don't know what it was, it was probably uh, 10 by 15 or so, their, little, their new little home. And we sang, I exalt thee. And then we sang a verse, uh, the chorus in, in Spanish, Yo te exalto, yo te exalto, yo te exalto, Señor. Um, and, and I can, man, the spirit was, was thick in the room. God is good, isn't he, church? Amen. Turn with me, if you would, to Matthew 3. Matthew 3. Now, um, we're picking up in verse 16, Matthew three sixteen. Now, um, set this passage up a little bit. You know, John the Baptist had, had been baptizing. He had been preparing, you know, preaching the gospel, been preparing the way for the coming of Christ. And um, he sees... Christ walking up, and, he, and the famous line that John the Baptist, as he sees Christ walking up, he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And he's, he's, that's tying back to uh, the Passover lamb that uh, was sacrificially given to, uh, to save the people. We, we kind of know that story. You know, Charlton Heston, you know, Moses, you know. Uh, but, but he's referring back to this, this story that now there will not have to be this sacrificial Passover lamb each year that Jesus is now the new Passover lamb, the eternal Passover lamb, once and for all. And so he, he recognizes Christ and, he, and, he, and Christ comes to him uh, and we see what he comes to him for in verse 16. As soon as Jesus was baptized, so John the Baptist baptizes him. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he came up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. And there is the Trinity. Boom. Right there. We've got Jesus, God the, God the Son. We've got the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit. And we've got God the Father speaking this blessing upon Christ. So immediately after Jesus was baptized, we pick it up in, in chapter 4, verse 1. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. Now there's, there's three accounts of, this, of Jesus being in the desert tempted by the, the devil. There's uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. All three have an account of this. We're reading it out of Matthew today. Uh, but you can go and kind of kind of see it in the others as well. The only one that doesn't is the, is the Gospel of John. After, after fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him. Who's the tempter? Satan. Satan came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And as he's quoting the, the Old Testament, which to them was, there wasn't an Old Testament and New Testament. At this moment, there was the Scriptures. So Jesus is quoting from, from the, uh, the, the Scriptures in Deuteronomy. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. That's a, and, and Jesus is, is uh, actually, set, did you know Satan knows scripture? Did, did you know that? Satan is quoting scripture out of Psalms 91. Jesus answered him, it is also written, so Jesus is saying, yeah, 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 that's written, but let me tell you what else is written. Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their splendor. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and the angels came and attended him. Now, in, I want you to note in, in Luke's version of this, uh, it says that the devil left him until an opportune time. He's coming back. It wasn't, the devil wasn't done. 
Let's pray. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. We ask you to, to speak to our hearts, speak in power and authority. We know, Holy Spirit, that's the only way you speak is in power and authority. So we ask you to speak and we ask you to soften our hearts, transform our hearts, teach our hearts, teach our minds. In Jesus' name, amen. So uh, this is the final, fifth week, final week of, of my sermon series on the Lord's Prayer. Um, and and if, if you're, especially if you're visiting with us today and haven't had a chance to, to get one of these, they're out on both of the welcome tables as you leave. There's a, there's a devotional book on the Lord's Prayer. I really encourage you to take one of those, take two or three of those if you need to. We've got plenty. And, um, and um, I've challenged our church uh, to pray the Lord's Prayer at noon every day, and, and just God just continues to amaze me the different times that, that, that my alarm goes off, what, what's, who I'm with, what I, what's going on in my life. Uh, sometimes I'm, uh, you know, I'm, on the weekend I may be out working in, in my shop and it goes off and it's kind of like, oh, Lord, I got a saw in my hand right now, but, you know, and so I have to kind of stop what I'm doing, but it refocuses me for the day. Sometimes I find myself with different people, people that, you know, it's kind of like, well, what's that about? And you, you explain to them. I've, I've got to pray with uh, my daughter, my wife this week. Went, went off when the three of us were together. That was the first time that the three of us have been together when it's, when it's gone off, and that was really neat. So, so I encourage you to be a part of that. Uh, on this coming Thursday, speaking of prayer, this coming Thursday uh, is a national day of prayer. And the One Kingdom team that I'm part of, uh, some different pastors and leaders in the city, uh, we're organizing a, a, a 14-hour prayer vigil. You don't have to stay all 14 hours, I promise. But over at the Love and Care Ministry prayer room over on uh, uh, North 2nd and Fannin, uh, that you can come. Our church is sponsoring the noon hour from 12 to 1. Uh, there'll be several of us there just leading. It's a come and go kind of a thing. You can come from 7 o'clock that morning to 8 o'clock that night. Uh, and just come, and man, our, man, with our elections coming up and our, the nation in the shape that we are in, we need to pray, don't we, church? Amen. So I uh, just invite you to that. But So we're, we're concluding the sermon series on the Lord's Prayer. Jesus taught us to pray, didn't he? I mean, it's, this is how the Lord taught us to pray. So, so the sermon series that we conclude today is God's Blueprint for Prayer. Today's message is, now in your bulletin it says, God is our protector. As I was preparing the sermon, I gave that uh, earlier this week to Pat, and she got it in there right. But um, I, I began to think about that word protector. He is our protector, but he's more than that. He is our deliverer. He, God, it says, for God to deliver us from evil, not just protect us from evil, but to deliver us from evil. So I've changed the title to God is our deliverer. Um, how many of you remember where you were on September the 11th, 2001? Most of us do. If, if we're, you know, not 10 years old, we remember what was going on. We remember what happened that day, and we remember how the day played out and how our world has changed ever since. Do you know, um, there was, I was thinking about that. The, we were just, we were kind of, you know, while we slept, while we slept as a nation, there were evil people plotting to destroy us. It, didn't, it doesn't really matter that we didn't know that. It doesn't really matter that, that we weren't aware of that or, or even if, if somebody had told us if we would or wouldn't have believed that. The fact of the matter is there were people plotting against us. They wanted to destroy us. And um, I, I just, you know, that's, I believe that's the way it is with our enemy, the devil. Scripture tells us that he, he, he roams around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Now, I know Christians that think that's, you know, just, uh, you know, been, you've been watching too many scary movies or something like that. And they don't even, I, I've actually, this was when I was a little boy, I can remember, I, I, was, I was probably a teenager, I can remember coming out of a pulpit, someone said that the devil isn't real. A pastor said the devil isn't real. I, 
So I, if that's the case, I wonder what Jesus is, is trying to teach us to pray to, um, you know, to resist the devil and in this, this um, uh, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In fact, it's our prayer that we've memorized says evil. But the, if you really start digging down into the actual scripture, it's speaking of the evil one, not just this, not just this cosmic you know, evil out there, you know, this kind of force of evil. But no, there is a, there is a specific evil one that, that, w that Jesus is saying we should be delivered from. So I just want to kind of look at very quickly at some, at some points about as we, as we look at this scripture. And that's this, this verse 13 of the, of the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6. First of all, the battle is real. And if we don't understand that, church, if we, if we don't understand that we have an enemy that seeks out to steal, kill, and destroy. I tell people that all the time that, that come to me, and especially like with marriages and, and people that are struggling with depression or whatever, I, I, I ask them, do you believe that, that there really is a, a devil that, that's, that's seeking, that he has, he has bad intentions toward us? Do you believe that? And if people say no, it's like, well, well we, so we got to start all over here. We got to, you know, Jesus spoke of that. He cast out demons and, you know, he cast out demons into the pigs. Like, what was that all about? If, if we don't believe that, we must understand that, that we are in a battle. It is real. Amen. Do you believe that, church? Amen. I mean, we don't like to talk about it because it's like, oh, you know, it's like kind of the fear and, and, and people think you're weird. Or I, in all honesty, if you think I'm weird for believing in the devil, I mean, I'm, I, this, you just have to get over it. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, it's in the scripture. Listen to, I just want to, I just want to quickly kind of look at some scriptures here. Ephesians, Paul is saying, our, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood. So that word struggle, I, that's, that jumped out at me as I read that scripture. We are in a struggle. We are in a battle. Our struggle, that implies that we're in a struggle. It, 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 doesn't, it doesn't mean like, hey, life is easy. This is, hey, this is, this is cool. You accept Jesus and it's all going to be good. No, in fact, the, the battle may even intensify. Amen. Probably will intensify. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's not against people, but it's against rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world. He's saying Satan and his demons have power and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. So, so there is a, a struggle going on, and it's not against people. It's a spiritual struggle going on. J Jesus said it this way, The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. So, so we have to understand that we have, we have two, two people that are... That, that want us, that, that want to capture something about us. We have, we have the devil. He wants to destroy us, and he doesn't play fair. He, he, doesn't, he, he, he works in our mind many times through, through our thoughts. It's like, man, I can't believe it. I bet I can get a better wife than her. <laughs> she doesn't treat me near as good as I deserve to be treated. I, probably, I don't think that, Cheryl. Or, hey, look at him. He treats me nice. He treats me a lot better than that guy at the house. Or, oh, this one click. Just, I just wonder, I just always wondered what, what that site might look like. Just, just one click. He, he, he wants to steal, kill, and destroy. So we have this, we have this, this person that wants to destroy us. His goal in life is destruction for us. And when we have this other person, his name is Jesus, and he wants to give us life. He wants to give us abundant life. So, we, so this, is, this is going on. Peter says it this way. Now, if anybody knows about the struggles of the, of the enemy, it's Peter. He says it this way. Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And then he goes on to say, resist him, stand firm in the faith. So there's, there's this, this struggle, this battle that's going on. 
whether we believe it or not, those 9-11 terrorists were plotting to destroy us even when we didn't know it and even if we didn't believe it. The, they were plotting to destroy us. It's happening in the spiritual realm right now. They want to destroy me. They want to destroy you. They want to destroy your family. They want to destroy this church. They want to destroy the message of Christ. They want, he wants to destroy. But Jesus wants us to have abundant life. He wants us to have joy, peace. Second thing that we can look at today, the Satan attacks where we are vulnerable. Now remember, temptation is not a sin. To, the, to be tempted is not a sin. Jesus was tempted, but he didn't succumb to sin. So, so the Lord's Prayer, this, this, this verse that we're looking at today, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So, so um, he looks for where we are vulnerable. Now, um, Jesus, it, we, this, this, these 40 days in the desert, says that he fasted for 40 days. And, and so Satan comes and he's, he's coming at him with these different temptations. The first, I, I, I kind of labeled it just physical desires, the physical needs of our, of our flesh. This, I'm hungry, I'm sleepy, those kinds of things. He, so so um, Satan says to Jesus... If you are the Son of God, now I, also, I really want to kind of insert a word there. It's not only if you are the Son of God, but I think because Jesus had, you know, just been baptized and the, the Holy Spirit had descended upon him and the God had spoken this blessing, this is my Son, who I'm well pleased. So and Satan saw that too. And so he knew. So it's really more like instead of if you are the Son of God, what he's really saying is since you are the Son of God. Since you are the Son of God, he's kind of like prove it. Show me what you got. If you're the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. So he was, he was coming at Jesus in these physical desires. He's, I'm hungry. And for us, that, that could be the physical desires uh, of our flesh. It could be uh, I'm hungry, sleepy, thirsty. It could be uh, sexual desires. It could be emotional desires, just those physical desires. Did you know what I was noting as I looked at this? In, in Jesus' ministry, he never used his power or his own benefit. You ever thought about that? I mean, he that's what and and that would have that would have uh, pleased Satan. You know, if or since you're the son of God, then then show me. Show me what you got. Jesus resisted that. And he, he met him with scripture. And then pride and, and ambition. If or since you're the son of God, throw yourself down. Show me that God can save you. Pride. Satan's desire was to sabotage the, the, minist the ministry and the mission of Christ any way he could. Then with power, all this I give you. You know, it's really funny that um, Satan is using this one on Christ. It's kind of like Christ is been seated at the right hand. It says that God became flesh and dwelt among us. You know, so God himself became flesh. So, so Jesus had been in heaven and he had come down in the, in the form of a man and yet Satan is trying to tempt him with power. Isn't that, isn't that funny? All this I give you. I, I'm, you know, I, I've kind of, I don't know if I'd have been Jesus right then, I might have gone, are you serious? <laughs> really? That's all you got? You know, you, you're trying to tempt me with, with that? All this I give you if you bow down and worship me. And Jesus resisted, and it says the devil left him until an opportune time. Um, I, I said, I touched on this earlier, but Satan does some of his greatest work in our minds. Um, listen to what the Apostle Paul in Philippians 4 says. Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. So what God is telling us is put godly things in your mind. Put godly things in when we When we, you know, and I, you've heard me say this before, but my old computer days when I was going to school for being a programmer, they used to say, you write a bad program, you're going to get bad results. 
If your, if your program is bad, bad results, now you say garbage in, garbage out. If it's bad, it's going to be bad results. And that's, that's what happens in our lives. And we continually, I, I'm, just, I'm just telling you, some of the music and the TV and television and stuff that we put into our minds, church, and golly, it's amazing that, you know, that we're not knocking off a 7-Eleven every weekend. You know, some of the stuff we put in our mind. Isn't it? Some of the, some of the d stuff we, that we digest. Whatever is true, whatever is noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, praiseworthy. Think about those things. Think about the things that, of God. And suddenly uh, we're going to see fruit coming out in our lives. Another passage about that is, is in 2 Corinthians. Take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. Well, we, you know, if we start thinking something that's not appropriate, I mean, we can't control always, we can't control those flittering thoughts. Somebody explained to me this way, you know, we can't keep a bird from flying through the barn, but we don't have to make it a nest. And, and so if, if we've got these, fl these thoughts that are flying through our head, sometimes it's like, whoa, I don't, where'd that come from? It's like we can't help that. But when we begin to dwell on it, when we begin to uh, make a nest, a place for those thoughts to live, that's when we are vulnerable. What, what Christ is saying is take every thought captive, make it obedient to Christ. Satan attacks us where we're vulnerable, church. So as I'm talking through this, I want you to ask yourself, where are you vulnerable? Where are you vulnerable? Third thing, God has not left us defenseless. God doesn't just throw us out to the wolves and go, I hope you do well. You know? He gives us weapons. How do we resist him? I want to give you uh, four things here that are strong and mighty weapons against the enemy. First, as, as I said, first of all, we have to believe we have an enemy and that he's plotting to destroy us. If we don't believe that, then everything I'm telling you this morning is really going in one ear and out the other. But if we believe we have an enemy and we understand that he attacks us where we're vulnerable and he wants to destroy us, then it'd be nice to have weapons against that, wouldn't it? All right, here they are. The first one is the power of the Holy Spirit. Notice that Jesus didn't do battle with the enemy until after he had been baptized and received the Holy Spirit. Then, then he launched his, that was the launching point of his ministry. That is, he go, immediately goes into the desert. He does battle with the enemy. Jesus full, in, in, in Luke 4, 1 says, Jesus full of the Holy Spirit returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the desert. So, so Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit, he was led by the Holy Spirit, and he was empowered by the Holy Spirit to do battle against the enemy. So if Jesus needed the Holy Spirit, how much more do we need the Holy Spirit? Um, and, and just a side note on the Holy Spirit, if, if you know, I know we, you know, we get, the Holy Spirit can kind of scare us sometimes because like, oh, I don't, I don't want to start rolling around on the floor or anything weird or anything. That's not what we're talking about. Okay, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about filled with the Holy Spirit, with, with power. That's what Jesus told the disciples. He said, wait until you are clothed with power. Don't we need power? Does anybody but me need power to, to, to live this life that we live and to defend ourselves and our family against the enemy? He said, we are be clothed with power. That's what we're talking about. And if you, if you don't feel that you have the Holy Spirit, come and visit with me. Let's talk. Let's, you know, what, what Scripture tells us is if you don't have it, ask, and it will be given to you to ask. Just ask, Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit. You know, and if you need, if you need to say, but I don't want to roll around on the carpet. If you need to say that, that's okay. <laughs> say that. But I, for, as for me, I don't want to put any limitations on the Holy Spirit for me. Like, Lord, I, give me all I can handle. Amen. You know, give me all I can handle. Because God is, to have God, to have more of God is never bad. It's just never bad. Amen. So our weapons are the power of the Holy Spirit. The second one is the strong name of Jesus. Say that name with me. Jesus. Jesus. Say it again. Jesus. Jesus. Say it again. 
Jesus. If you ever feel threatened, I mean, some, I don't know about you, just sometimes I just, I just feel, uh, maybe I get up in the middle of the night and I just it's like, mm, I feel, this, I just don't feel right right now. Something, is, something's not right here. And sometimes, one time, this is a couple of years ago, I was going to the bathroom in the middle of the night. You know, when you get old, you do that. And, and, <laughs> but sometimes you do it many times. But anyway, that's another thing. But, <laughs> little ones over there <laughs> laughing at me. But, I, I just sometimes I just feels like things things are not right here in, in the house right now, and I'll be getting up, going to the bathroom, and I'm just like, in the name of Jesus, whatever's going on here, you know, just be gone. Amen. And one time I remember coming back to bed and she goes, "Were you talking to somebody?" <laughs> you remember that? That was about two years ago, and I, so now I start to say, "In the name of Jesus." I mean, I said, I don't want to wake Cheryl up, but God hears me. Oh, my golly. It doesn't happen all the time, but, but I think the, the more we mature in Christ, the more we begin, begin to get discerning that this, like sometimes with Cheryl and I, you know, in the old days, if we, had a, if we had a fight, I mean, you know, it might go a week or two, and it's like, we didn't know any better. But now we understand we have a spiritual discernment. It's like, what are we even fighting about? What are we even fighting about? I mean, it's, we got to stop that, and there's something in the spiritual realm that wants to, to, to destroy us. And, and there's power in the name of Jesus. Listen to all these scriptures. I'm not going to, many of them are listed there. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. Man, isn't that good news? Salvation is found in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And then when, in, in Luke chapter 10, Jesus sends out uh, the disciples, and he sent out more than the 12. He sent out 72, and they returned with joy. And here's what they said. Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. In your name. Even the demons. Well, first of all, there it is. Even the demons. It's like, well, I'm sure demons were just in the biblical days. They're not demons anymore. It's like, I know that's weird for us to talk about. You don't hear it coming from the pulpit all the time, but I'm just telling you, we have an enemy. Amen. He's real. He wants to destroy us. He has demons, just like Christ has angels. And there's this spiritual battle going on even in the heavenlies that we don't see. It is going on, and he wants you. And he wants your soul and he wants your family. And yet we have the strong name of Jesus. There is no name above Jesus. And it says that the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and on he in heaven and on earth and under the earth. He's talking about, and I love it. It's like I have the name of Jesus. And if, and if Satan starts messing with me, it's like, hit your knees, big guy. In the name of Jesus, hit your knees right now. So we have the power of the Holy Spirit as a weapon. We have the strong name of Jesus as a weapon. We have the blood of Jesus in our testimony. Revelation 12 says it this way. They, speaking of the believers, the, the accuser of the believers, they overcame him, the accuser of the believers, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. So the blood of the Lamb, it's like what Jesus accomplished on the cross, his blood that purchased our uh, salvation is a weapon. His blood, his name is a weapon, his Holy Spirit is a weapon, his blood is a weapon, and we can pray that blood. And it also says our testimony. So what's he talking about? Our testimony, I, I, just, I, I just tell the devil, I belong to Jesus. I belong to Jesus. I've been bought by the blood of Jesus. I'm his. Check the book. It's there. My name is there. So we have the, the weapons that we have against this enemy, the power of the Holy Spirit, the strong name of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, and our testimony, and finally, God's word. God's word. And, and I want to tell you that um, holding it and putting it, having 10 in your house doesn't put it here or here. 
you know, yeah, it's nice to hold the Bible and, you know, but, but what did Jesus, how did Jesus do battle with the enemy? He proclaimed the word of God to him. Yeah, 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 you can, yeah, okay, fine, Jesus says, but it's written. Ephesians 6, we, we've, many of us have heard this, this passage before, the, put on the full armor of God. When the day of evil comes, it doesn't say if the day of evil comes. It says when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and, and after you have done everything to stand, stand firm with the belt of truth. Now listen, these are, I want you to notice, all of these weapons, these, this full armor of God, they're all defensive weapons but one. They're all defensive weapons, but one. The belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness. So these are, you know, protections. The gospel of peace, peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation. And here we go. The sword, the offensive weapon, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. You want to take the battle to the enemy and not just deflect his blows, open up the word of God. Know the word of God. Don't just listen to what I'm telling you that it says. I might be wrong. I've never been before, but I might be. <laughs> you never know. The sword of the spirit, the word of God. You know, um, I said earlier that Satan knows scripture, and, he, and he, what he does with everything is he takes good things and he, he twists and perverts. He, he does it, just think about music. Music's a wonderful thing. The Psalms are full of, of music. God's praises. What has he done with music? You know, pull, you pull your down, hats down to your knees and you, and you throw some chains on and you start throwing out some garbage that, that gets into our mind and our heart. And, and don't think that I'm just picking on, you know, rap because I used to listen to a lot of country music. I mean, and it's, it doesn't matter, pop, it doesn't matter what it is. I, I, some, I look back at some of the songs that I learned as a young person, and I'm, I'm singing along, and I'm like, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> what in the world are they talking about? There's, I won't even, there's some of them, I'm, you know, popular songs when we were growing up, my age was growing up, and it's like, I'm singing, and it's like, oh, that's raunchy. <laughs> I didn't even know it. He takes the internet, which is a wonderful thing. I use the internet all the time and, and, and for great things. But he twists and he perverts and he distorts and he, and he, and he turns good things into evil and, and all these different things in our lives. He does the same with Scripture. But Jesus, when he was teaching us to pray, he said, Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. There is a, I've, you've, I've played this a couple of times in the last 12 or 13 years, but I, I just love this clip. And, and uh, Pastor E.V. Hill, if you've been here for very long, you've heard this clip before. But Pastor E.V. Hill, he's, he's going to be with Jesus now, a great man of God, and, and um, was spoke at the first Promise Keepers event. I believe it was in like 1993 or so in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, and and E.V. could bring it, man. He could bring it. And listen to what he has to say about this scripture that we're looking at today. Go ahead, Lee, if you'd play that. Three. It is written. This is the body of Christ broken for you. It is written, this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you, for all who would believe in Jesus Christ. If you'll pray with me. Father, we thank you for this bread and this cup. 
there is no weapon formed against us that will prosper because you have defeated the enemy. You defeated him at the cross. You defeated him at the empty tomb. Death itself cannot stand in your face. We pray that you would bless this bread and this cup, God, that they would be for us the body and blood of Jesus Christ. We rejoice that, that we serve a risen and a victorious God. You are our rock and our fortress and our deliverer. In Jesus' name, amen. Hi, this is Pastor Jeff Hatcher with Wiley United Methodist Church in Abilene, Texas. I want to thank you for listening to this, uh, this message from God's Word today. I want to remind you that you have a Savior. His name is Jesus Christ, and He came to set you free. He came to heal the brokenhearted. He did that by hanging on the cross in our place. If you have never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want to, I want to invite you to do that today. If you want to do that, just pray this prayer with me. Father, uh, I repent of my sins. I confess to you that I am a sinner. I ask Jesus Christ to come into my heart, to free me from my sin, to, to be my Savior and my Lord. Uh, help me to be the creation that you have, have created me to be. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer today for the first time, I want to ask you to do four things. First of all, I want to ask you to, to share that decision with a member of the clergy. Let them know that you've made that decision. Secondly, I want, you, I want to ask you to be baptized. God's Word says that uh, believers in Jesus Christ, we affirm that and we celebrate that through baptism. And thirdly, I want to ask you to begin to read God's Word, to get into His Word, not just because uh, we think that that makes us good, but because this is the Word of life. And finally, to, to find a Bible-believing and preaching church to be a part of. If you've made that decision, I also welcome uh, a co conversation with you. You can reach me at jhatcher at wileymethodist.org, and I'd be happy to come along your side in that journey. God bless you.